Oh, nice crowd. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for our first forum of the academic year. We're excited to have a packed house here in the house and hopefully online as well. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics and we manage the forum. And so we want to pay particular welcome or bring particular welcome to all the freshmen in the audience and the first year graduate students. So how about a round of applause for our newcomers to our Harvard community. Tonight's forum uh, is being co-sponsored and it's kind of the brainchild of the Shorenstein Center on Press Politics and Public Policy. Uh, and my colleague, Alex Jones, who's the director of the Shorenstein Center, uh, please come up and continue the welcome. Alex. <clears throat> We're not going to have an infinite number of welcomes, but there are a few things that have to be said. Uh, first of all, I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. We're so pleased to have you, and we're very proud. This is a very happy night for us. Uh, the Riptide Project is one that took an enormous amount of work and will continue to take an enormous amount of work because one thing you should understand about Riptide is that it's online for a purpose. It's online because it's organic, it's going to grow, it's going to expand, there will be other voices, there will be other uh, strands of this incredibly important story that will be pursued over time. But the core of it, the thing that we are celebrating tonight is the incredibly hard work of the three Shorenstein Fellows last semester who did that job. John Huey, Martin Niesenholtz, and Paul Sagan. You're going to be hearing from all three of them tonight. But I would be remiss if I did not also invite you, please, to join me in thanking some other people who were absolutely instrumental in making it happen. First of all, Josh Benton at the Neiman Foundation. Josh is the head of their, of their journalism lab uh, site. He created and built the website that is the elegant creature that we have called Riptide. Uh, Anne-Marie Lipinski, the curator of the Neiman Foundation, uh, we want to thank the Neiman Foundation especially for hosting our Riptide site. And at the Shorenstein Center, I want to especially thank Nancy Palmer, Edie Hallway, Tom Patterson, and Janelle Sims for their enormous work in making this possible. It would not have happened without them. If you would please join me in a round of applause. And with that, I will turn this over to John Huey, who will uh, raise the veil on Riptide and explain what, uh, what it's all about. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Alex. That may be a metaphor too far, raising the veil on the riptide, <laughs> but I'll do my best. First of all, I too want to thank some people. Mostly I want to thank Alex Jones for making the Shorenstein Fellowship the best possible destination for a journalist seeking sanctuary, perspective, re-inspiration, and great company. I think um, I'm speaking for all, both of my co-authors when I say that. We, it, it's just a great place. For making it all work so smoothly, the same people that you thanked, uh, Nancy Palmer, Edie Holway, Janelle Sims, and really the whole Shorenstein staff uh, for making it feel like a home away from home, and all three of us are really glad to be back home here. It feels great. So to explain Riptide ever so briefly, how it came to be. Three world-weary executives wash up on the shores of Harvard University, all frankly uh, looking for a nest on the ground and trying to avoid all the work that would be involved in having to write a 1,500 word, a 15 page white paper. That seemed like far too much for us. So we said, no, we're not gonna do that. Martin Nissenholtz, an internet journalism pioneer who ran the digital efforts there at the New York Times for 17 years. Paul Sagan, a leading edge internet CEO from Akamai, right down the road here, but also a second generation journalist with a background in newspapers, television, and, and uh, digital journalism. And me, uh, an old uh, reporter, editor, and recently escaped publishing executive. And we, what we did was we sat around and we argued because we didn't really agree on a whole lot, but we were all interested in the same topic and that was 
the digital disruption of the journalism business. Our questions were simple. What happened? Uh, how, did, how did we blow it? What could have we done differently? And we argued about it for a while, and finally we proposed to our masters at Shorenstein, we're gonna do this oral history, and I think they thought that we were all crazy. Um, but we had Googled the topic, and we found that there were 77,000 articles that had been written on this subject, and we used that to say, we don't need to write 77,000 first article. So we decided to, um, target the key institutions and the key decision makers going back 35 years. And our original idea was 10 key moments, 20 people will be in and out of here in a heartbeat. We, we met a lot of skepticism, but uh, we finally found a godfather in Nico Mele, who we went to and he said, this is a great idea. He showed us a template for it, which frankly we stole from uh, <coughs> Vanity Fair. Uh, but we improved on it, Graydon and uh, in terms of adding video. And we got his endorsement, and we also, he steered us to a graduate student here at the Kennedy School named Alex Remington. And this is the way these things work. Alex was very intense. He now works at the Washington Post, I'm happy to say, so people do still find jobs in the, well, newspaper business from Harvard. He led us, in turn, to Josh Benton, who uh, has already been cited, but who really is the guy who made our fantasy become reality. And, just did a great job. So, and then watching over it all wisely was Tom Patterson, but more importantly than his subtle help, he is, his wife, Laurie, gave us the video camera that we used to interview all these 60 people, because as we learned, we thought Harvard was a fabulously wealthy institution, but I, that $30 billion or whatever it is does not go to video cameras for Shorenstein fellows. <laughs> Tom Patterson's wife, Laurie, provided the video camera. Anyway, we got carried away. We did 63 interviews. We wrote a 44,000-word essay. The whole thing in its entirety, and I don't want to discourage anyone from reading our project or looking at it, but the whole thing in its entirety totals 444,000 words, which is more than the 418,053 in Gone with the Wind. But less than the 587,000 in War and Peace. So it is, it is doable. Martin and, pa Martin and this very distinguished panel to whom we're all really grateful, not only for the interviews, but for coming here tonight to help us explain it. We'll get to the meat, but I wanna give you a little color from the road with seven quick awards. Number one, justifiably proudest of his office, David Bradley of the Atlantic Media, Huge sweeping views of the Potomac. It is what moguldom is supposed to look like in the movies, and it's the first thing he shows you and the last thing he shows you. Very proud of that office. The most ironic moment occurred in the Google conference room high atop a building in Silicon Valley where we were gonna interview Eric Schmidt, Richard Gingras, and others. All kind of array of electronic equipment. Impossible for anyone to figure out how to get electricity to come out of the wall outlet. We, <laughs> we had to have a technician come to the room and he said, oh, it happens all the time. <laughs> so, I think they're the, one of the largest users of electricity in the world, but they cannot plug something into the wall and make it work. So they don't know everything. The best smoothie. We awarded this, this is a local award. It goes to the Elvis at the Life Alive Vegan Restaurant down the street in Cambridge. That's where uh, reclusive Jerry Levin insisted we meet him for breakfast before we could interview him. I had the Elvis, it's delicious, chocolate, peanut butter, vegan. Uh, the New Era Most Disruptive Workspace Award goes to Andrew Sullivan's tiny apartment in Greenwich Village. Two ancient dogs suffering from COPD during the interview. If you listen carefully, you can hear <laughs> Bags of Five Guys burgers strewn around. That is what the new journalism looks like. The most camera shy, shockingly, goes to Arianna Huffington, the only interviewee who refused to be uh, video recorded. And the missing link, or one that got away so far, goes to Rupert Murdoch, who agreed in principle, loved the project, but things kept coming up. He had a really, really busy year and wasn't able to make it. We're hoping someone will be able to get him next year. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Martin, to get to, down to the meat of the matter.
CEO of the news, thank you, uh, newspaper publish, uh, publishing, uh, Newspaper Association of America. She was also the CEO and publisher of Washington Post Newsweek Interactive, so plays, plays two very important roles in this uh, history. And of course, Arthur Sulzberger, Jr., the chairman of the New York Times Company and the publisher of the New York Times. And I want to start with a sort of a ground setting question to each of the panelists, starting with Tim and then going to my left. And it has to do with the sort of the state of journalism. If you were a doctor and the state of American journalism was your patient, what would, how would you assess the diagnosis? Uh, I think if you looked at the data, you'd be really concerned because, uh, you know, if you look at the number of journalists that's gone down by roughly 30 percent in the last seven or eight years, uh, newspaper revenue, which is, is uh, pe people think of journalism as, uh, as newspapers in many cases, is down about 55 percent. Uh, I think you see uh, real resistance in terms of uh, the digital landscape. Do people believe that content's going to work? We're, we're one of the largest investors in content in the digital landscape and journalism. And so I think if you just kind of froze things right now, you'd say uh, the patient needs a lot of work uh, and there's a continued progress on that work. Um, I think if you look forward, though, it, uh, there's some very exciting things on the horizon. And um, one of the things that I'm most excited about about journalism is that you know, journalists are essentially networks uh, on their own. And if you see the bleeding edge of what's happening in journalism and some of the work that you did at New York Times or uh, the Washington Post has done, from a digital standpoint, you start to see the excitement of what's uh, potentially possible. Consumers like to pay for content. Uh, consumers want curated, high quality content. And uh, I think there's a very large role for journalism in the future. But if you froze it right now, uh, I think you'd have to say that there's been a very rough period of time uh, and people really need to focus on where the future models are going and get there quickly. Mm -hmm. Caroline? Uh, I promised you I wouldn't have my lobbyist hat on. Um, I would say that we're definitely in transformation. The sort of 80% print revenue, 20% print circulation has dramatically changed even since um, 2006. So the revenue is diversifying. The audiences have never been larger. Fully 70% of US adults in any given week read a newspaper online in print or mobile, so audiences are not a problem. Um, it is the revenue that's continuing to be a real challenge. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the stuff that I read, um, esti estimates say that, the, that it's leveling out. Mm -hmm. Arthur? Um, I was thinking about actually using dentistry instead of doctors. Is that okay? <laughs> because I think we're, um, we're losing our, 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 our first teeth and growing our new teeth. And it's painful and uh, it's tough to lose teeth and we're seeing that happen. But we know that what's coming is going to be uh, bigger to the point of reach, bigger to the point of impact because we are now able to reach um, people around the world, and when we started in this business, that was impossible to imagine. Mm -hmm. Great. So following on to that, I mean, wh one of the folks that we interviewed, obviously, as part of this was Don Graham, along with Caroline um, at, from the Washington Post, and we didn't know at the time, although if you actually read between the lines, particularly in the part we excerpted at the end of the, uh, the essay, uh, he just sold the, the, the paper, the, the journalism business, the Washington Post, to Jeff Bezos for $250 million. I think it was two years ago, you paid $315 million, or that was the reported price for the Huffington Post. And it just goes to kind of show the kind of relative values out there, the, the business models. But do you think Bezos got a better deal than you? Uh, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, first of all, when we bought the Huffington Post, many people questioned what the value was uh, overall and how much we had paid for it. Today, if you talk to investors or people, they think actually the Huffington Post is probably worth a tremendous amount more uh, than what we paid for it. And the reason is, is because uh, Ariana recognized something very uh, distinctly about how information gets transferred and how people want information, you know, uh, Huffington Post has been the number one distributed news source on Facebook 
And I think from a valuation standpoint, when you look at the fact that HuffingPost has essentially gone from zero to 100 million video views, we launched HuffPost Live, which is the first cable channel for the web under Huffington Post, that the migration of what we bought was essentially a purely digital uh, DNA company and has now migrated into one of the best brands in the world. It's in 10 countries. Uh, and you know, my experience in newspapers and, and news started actually right outside of this room. I owned one newspaper in Boston, I started one, and we ended up buying something called The Square Deal. And for people who are from Harvard, they'll remember The Square Deal. It was a free newspaper we used to hand out right up the street in, in Cambridge. And you know, the, the day that I changed my viewpoint on where news and newspapers were going, I went down to MIT one day when I was here and I saw Mosaic. And I saw the development of Precursor and Mosaic about information coming up on a screen and getting electronically transferred. I walked back to our office, which is right down the street from here, and I said to my partner, I don't know what this internet thing is, but I'm leaving and doing it. We need to sell the, you know, get out of what we're doing and because I've never seen information be able to transfer, you know, that easily. And I think Ariana essentially understood that and applied it at a massive scale to, uh, you know, to news and, and did it in a, in a disruptive way. So I think Jeff's purchase of the Washington Post was a great purchase and really interesting. I see John Henry from the Boston Globe uh, in the front row uh, as well. Uh, I think that the future will be bright because that DNA is going to get plugged in and transferred and, and you did it at the New York Times. Uh, I don't know how many subscribers the New York Times has now, but you know, that transformation has been really substantial. So I think I got a great deal on Huffington Post uh, and I think Jeff probably got a good deal on Washington Post depends on, depending on what he do with it, does with it. I want to stay, uh, thank you, I want to stay on the Washington Post for, for a minute and it, it, it relates a little bit to the, the Globe as well. Uh, I mean, Caroline, you were you ran the the digital division at uh, at the Post, and then I think left after it was integrated back into the parent. But in retrospect, do you think it was inevitable that the Graham family uh, would would sell to someone like Bezos, or is there something that could have been done at some stage that would have changed that future? I don't I don't think it was inevitable. Um, I'm probably not answering your question. It's just too hard to say. I, I, I think it's quite wise to sell to Bezos. I mean, Jeff and Don have been friends for a long time. They share similar values. I think that understanding that the technology and having to understand an audience, which is something that newspapers didn't traditionally have to do, but now really have to do it, is quite wise. And you know, Bezos understands you know the subscription model and putting it into a private place, they're not going to have the pressure of being in a, public, a part of a public company. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it was inevitable. I, I admire the Grams for doing it because I think that they are trying to put the Washington Post in the best possible place for the future and that took a lot of courage in my view. So Arthur, um, the idea of a, a paper of record has changed dramatically over the past century. Um, uh, today we have, as, as Tim alluded to with HuffPo, we have lots of creators and the dominant distribution channels are companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter. We've often chatted about, or we've sometimes chatted about the nature of an authoritative source in this highly fragmented world. And if there's any one news organization, I think, in the United States that still probably has that as part of its DNA, it's the New York Times. But what is the nature of authority in a world where there are literally tens of thousands of highly verticalized publications on every imaginable topic? I think the nature of, uh, of authority hasn't changed. So let's, I think quite frankly, authority is still about accuracy. It's about breadth. Uh, it's about knowing and calling out your own mistakes when you make them. Um, and having experienced people on the ground who not, don't parachute into a story, uh, but come in knowing the landscape of a story. And uh, I think that has not gotten any less important. I think it's, got, it's grown in importance because quite frankly, um, there are fewer and fewer places like that. Uh, think about how many news organizations uh, today have uh, bureaus around the country or bureaus around the world where people actually work and live and uh, in Egypt or in other places. Uh, so I think that hasn't changed. And uh, 
the joy of the digital era is the speed of information, the joy is the reach, and the ability to take in points of view very quickly and bring that into some story line. Um, the, the, it's a remarkable opportunity for us all. The downside is clear. All of a sudden, everybody is looking at the photo of the Boston bomber. Everybody knows it's the Boston bomber. He's been clearly identified, except it's not him, because it swept through the digital world so fast, and it was just picked up. And that kind of accuracy is, 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 is critical, especially at a time when decisions are being made so fast. Okay, let's, let's go back to uh, Riptide for a moment. During your interview, Tim, I mean, you spoke quite enthusiastically about Patch, AOL's local journalism effort. Um, what, you know, since, since the interview, you know, a bunch of things have been announced, but the, the main thing is that you've decided to kind of downsize the operation. Can you talk about why, what, what, is, what is the nature of local journalism and why is it so hard? Uh, sure, so Patch, for those of you who don't know about it, you should probably do after last month, uh, is a uh, product that we rolled out to 900 communities across the U.S. And basically the theory on it was what, exactly what Arthur just uh, talked about, which was the authoritative nature of local uh, journalism. And uh, from a platform perspective, basically you had the receding nature of uh, publications and news uh, not getting invested in at the same level locally. I had that issue in my town uh, where I lived. And Patch was, uh, it is a very aggressive uh, stance on our standpoint that uh, local people living in local communities will want local information and it's important to them. And I think from the standpoint of what we've seen at Patch, Patch basically has gone from zero to uh, our internal metrics are about 18 million uh, unique visitors on Patch in the 900 towns. Uh, Patch's expansion was really rapid. Um, we took a risk as a public company to do it because Patch really is, it has been more looked at, I think, from the investment community as something you should do privately. Uh, but our theory was there was a massive disruption going on in, in news and uh, in information locally. Uh, there would be uh, lots of consumer interest, lots of business interest, and from a bold standpoint, we should do a land grab, essentially, uh, after, the, after that audience. And, what we announced over the summer was basically taking, there's 500 patches that have uh, business models and, and work that look like they're gonna work. There's 400 that have traffic uh, where we don't have the probably business model or ability to put sales there fast enough, so we're gonna partner with uh, other companies. And since we announced that, we have uh, you know, basically 10 or 15 companies, uh, large companies that have offline uh, newspapers, television stations around those areas where we have patches. The patches are in 900 of the best GDP communities across the United States. And in many cases, the patches from a traffic standpoint have equal or more traffic than the large offline media properties do in those, uh, in those regions. So there's a lot of interest on partnering with patch. Uh, I would say from the standpoint of you know, an investment that matters, a real, not a feature, but an investment in communities in the United States. Patch is probably the single biggest investment in journalism in the United States in local communities. And I think the fact of the matter is Patch will continue to go on post-partnership or post whatever we do with Patch uh, overall because there's such a, an acute need for information locally. Uh, so I would say looking forward on Patch, you'll probably see us do partnerships uh, AOL will probably own some of the patches and we'll probably do partnerships with traditional media companies around those, uh, those cities. But uh, I would just say overall as, an, as a leader of AOL, uh, AOL employees and audience uh, and investors put a lot of energy into patch, which I think was really good for the country. I've had more newspaper people stop me to say, oh my God, the patches around our city made our local newspaper invest in more journalism because they were afraid that you guys were gonna get, get you know, more aggressive, and, and I'm not talking about small, because some of the bigger companies also did that. So I think Patch helped fuel both local community information, but also the fact that journalism matters in local communities and people should be investing in it. Great, so um, Caroline, when we talked to Julius Janikowski, I, I don't know whether you read his interview, but he, uh, he had commissioned a study, and what he found, consistent with what Tim has just said, is that the toughest problems 
economically are on the local side, and many of your members are, are on, on the local side. Can you talk a little bit about that now? You've heard Tim talk about Patch from a newspaper perspective. I mean, is, is it as bad as Julius's study suggests? You know, the numbers suggest that the top 200 metro areas have the toughest time. And when you go smaller than that, it's actually stronger. Mm -hmm. So, but that big 200 is a big number. Um, it's, it's very difficult to cover what you know, companies covered in the past, given the pressures on newsroom budgets and a dramatic cut in, in advertising revenue. I mean, there's, this, there's just no question for it. And it is, and oftentimes the newspaper, I'm not disregarding Patch, but a study that Pew did showed that, you know, 85% of, of all media stories, i.e. TV, cable, radio, start from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so can you point to areas of innovation? Is, would, would digital first be an area? You know, what are the bright spots? Tim talked about in his setup, you know, innovation and, and getting to the next phase. Arthur talked about, you know, kind of you're losing your baby teeth. Do you see any evidence of that when you look out at the landscape? What are you seeing uh, that yeah, would suggest that, I mean, that people are actually losing their baby teeth and so growing well, something new? you know, hindsight is always 2020, right? But think about it. We had this walled garden, right? If you at wanted to advertise shoes in Washington, you pretty much had to advertise in the Washington Post. And if you wanted to buy shoes on sale, you had to look at the Washington Post. The internet changes everything. Yet on the digital side, we sort of approached it as, well, you just got to sell a bunch of banner ads, and maybe that'll make up for the cost in the newsroom. I'm speaking, you know, obviously facetiously. That doesn't work, obviously. We sort of figured that out. Um, so we are, as I said, we're, we're looking at a lot of different revenue streams. I mean, a huge change, in the, even in the last five years. Different businesses, digital agencies that have been started by companies, um, events businesses, conference businesses, niche print publications. There's no silver bullet. Um, we saw circulation go up for the first time in many years last year with 23% print and digital alike. So I'm seeing, and again, this is, there, and there's not a one size fits all. What works obviously for, for, for the New York Times does not fit for another newspaper and what fits for a small newspaper, you have to know your market. But there, there, is, there is innovation going on, and, and I'm not saying it's just like, gee, you're finished going to the dentist. Sadly, that's not true. But to use Arthur's... We um, haven't gotten to cavities yet. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. Um, but, but I'm seeing innovation, and it's, it's heartening. It really is. It's exciting. So speaking of which, at the Times, Arthur, you've talked, Mark Thompson has talked about the internationalization of the brand. Right. Um, I don't think that... There, there has ever been a newspaper that has been a truly international paper. Maybe, maybe the FT in its niche, obviously the IHT, the international well the IHT, Tribune, but it was a right? small, small newspaper but for expats. Clearly but international. We were talking about right. you know, something much larger you know, when we talk about the New York Times. Now the website pretty much went internationally the minute we turned it on, right. but translating that into revenue has proved to be difficult. What is the model that you're thinking about when you go global with a U.S. news brand? Well, um, a little bit of history. Sure. So the International Herald Tribune is owned by the New York Times, and uh, uh, we are going to be, in October, changing, rebranding it, the, the International New York Times. It's actually, actually bringing back a brand that did exist uh, back in the 50s and 60s, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But um, uh, it's clearly a digital, only, this is a digital play. And uh, on the web, if you went to IHT.com, you wound up at NYTimes.com. Uh, so uh, the, the purpose is to reach the international community that we believe is ours, is, is out there for a general interest newspaper. And, the, and we're the first general interest. The FT, the Wall Street Journal, they've been doing this, but they're not general interest the way the Times is. Um, and it is, uh, it's going to be an exciting opportunity for us. And uh, we've tried it. Uh, our first in language uh, was in China. Uh, then we wrote a story that uh, upset the Chinese government. 
and they've shot us down for uh, about a year now. Um, the story did go on to win a Pulitzer Prize, so there is uh, a trade-off there. But um, it, it really does speak to our core value. I mean, you know, we knew this story was going to was going to cause heartache for us in a business that we had just invested in and just opened. But our core values are so critical to who we are and to the the the, the value proposition of the Times that uh, we we did what we felt we had to do and run and run that story. But let me. Just go back for a second and, and say that you know when I travel, uh, it is clear that there is a lot more for us to do to make international, um, to reach our international potential. The, the IHT to uh, the International New York Times is just a step. Um, right now, for example, if you um, want to subscribe to the New York Times, we, we don't give you the ability to do it in your own currency. We're fixing that. That's just an easy example. So there's much more we could be doing and are doing, but there's no doubt that the desire is there. And Martin's heard this story, but I'll share it. This is when, when I was in China, just prior to us going with the idea of a Chinese language website, I met with a Chinese general, a couple of Chinese generals, one of whom, a woman, interestingly, began our conversation by really talking in a very angry way. She was very upset. We had just begun to charge for the web not too long ago, and the problem was that every morning she would wake up, and the first thing she would do is she would go to nytimes.com to see what had happened in the world, and it wouldn't accept her credit card. Well, it turns out we didn't accept PLA credit cards. We fixed her problem. But the point of the matter is a Chinese general, first thing in the morning, she would go to the New York Times. And if that doesn't speak to the nature, changing nature of the world and the opportunities we have, I can't think of what else does. I want to just follow up with, the, with kind of the other end of it. When we had our interview, Arthur, we, we talked about the metered model. And all three of you have brought up pay mm -hmm. models. And I want to just go down the road on that for just a second with you, Arthur. Mm -hmm. um, we, you, we talked in the interview about young people and the notion that you know, young people don't seem to be as willing to pay for content on the web. Music was a good example of that uh, as, as, uh, you know, as, as the, frankly, offline media products. Um, do you think that as young people you know, mature, they will be willing to pay for a digital subscription to the New York Times? Well, let's start um, with the fact that more and more young people and all people are showing a willingness to pay for experiences they value on the web. Thank you, Steve Jobs. Right? I mean, it is now simple to buy a game, to buy something that you find of value at a multiple, at what, a number of ages. So that's changing. But the second thing is, let's not pretend that 14-year-olds bought newspapers. They didn't, and they never did. And people come to newspapers when they find the need for the, the value equation. And often that's when they get a first job, or when they have a family, and they start to think about what the community also is, is, is offering, and what public schools are, and, and, how the, and they start to engage with the community in a different way. And absolutely, I think that those things are coming together. Uh, Tim, I, I want to go to your content strategy because it's really interesting. You, I think you, you create some content and then you sell access or you, you do deals with people like Everyday Health to provide access to your audience. Can you explain what, what, how you make the decision between what you'll cover and what other people should cover and h how do you do that? Sure, so our, our kind of a simplistic way, our strategy is essentially to, uh, we have a theory that uh, most people care about a limited set of things. 70% of web users use less than 15 sites a month. And I'll just underline something that Arthur just said is, as people tend to get older, their time becomes more valuable uh, as well. So people start to spend more time on the things that matter uh, more to them, they're more willing to pay for things. Uh, those things. So our strategy has actually been to be the most human-based company in terms of the content areas that we 
uh, focus on. So we essentially have picked out this 80-80-80 strategy, uh, which is, uh, you know, 80% kind of based on uh, women, 80% based on influencers and influencer type uh, events, and 80% based on either local or global in terms of scale. When I say the 80%, it's essentially the 80% uh, of consumption that happens against uh, the, the economy and what people care about. So uh, pretty much we put a filter against all of the categories that we have from a content perspective and try to make decisions based on where we're going to have huge influence over the things that we invest in versus partner. And, uh, and I'll give you an example. We're running TechCrunch Disrupt right now in San Francisco. I'm heading out there tomorrow morning. Uh, there's 3,000 of the most influential engineers uh, in the country and in the world there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, almost every ma major CEO from our industry will be there on stage. And TechCrunch gets looked at around the world by anyone who's interested in the technology space. So that's an example of an influencer space that we have a major, major, major share of mind share in that we can be successful from a journalism and from a monetary uh, standpoint. So that was the first generation of our content strategy, was essentially get in these giant spaces and be influential. The second generation of the content strategy has been to build out massive partnership networks around those areas. So uh, AOL owns a number of brands that people know, the Huffington Post, TechCrunch and Gadget, uh, Movie Phone. Uh, but what we've also done is built a giant B2B infrastructure technology-wise next to those properties to service other people in those industries. So we service about 40,000 other publishers now with uh, video, with advertising, with content uh, sharing, those things. So, you know, we, I, I fundamentally believe that uh, technology won't change humans, that humans will t change technology. The first couple generations of the web have been about people trying a lot of things, but over time people will regulate back to the things they care most about. And I'll end with one quick story. Last year I had our interns and in, college interns, and I do uh, dinner with them at the end of the summer just to get their feedback on the company. And last summer I asked them, uh, what are the p changing patterns you're having as a college student? There were three changing patterns. Uh, one was they're following fewer things on Twitter. Uh, second thing was that they're following more influential brands. New York Times is one of the things they talked about a lot. Uh, and they're following uh, just the high level influencer people. And the third thing is they're changing their personal profiles on the web. They don't want their personal profiles to be dictated by a giant social network that's got all kinds of information about them on them. So a lot of them have started to migrate information towards LinkedIn and other things where they want to have solid profiles of themselves, not, for, not to look for jobs, just to have that level of area. So our content theory is essentially, when you boil it down, is that the, the college intern conversation, which is let's invest in the most important areas of journalism, information, and content, build giant B2B technology networks around it, and service people who want to have very solid pieces of information to live their lives. And that, that pretty much dictates everything we do. And how does the HuffPo fit into that? Is that when you talk, is that a scalable, pla do you view the Huffington Post as a platform uh, play? Or is that Huffington Post is a triple play for us, which is, uh, it's influencer. When I, I was up uh, early this Saturday morning and just reading content on the web and I was on the Huffington Post and we started this thing called Serenity Saturdays uh, that Ariana is doing with AOL and Huffington Post and we launched the Huffington Post Hawaii edition. Who was the blogger we had uh, talk about HuffPost Hawaii? It was Oprah. Um, so with uh, Huffington Post, you have a global news platform now. I think Huffington Post, along probably with the New York Times, is aggressively going mm -hmm. to be the first global information source, uh, pan country. We have influencers you on do, that property. You do, yours are in language, right? We do in language, yes. And, and, and Arthur, are you doing in language? We're, we, China was our first in language, and at the moment it's, it's, it's halted. It, we're still producing it, and we still get lots of traffic to it, but not from within China. Uh -huh. okay. So Huffington Post is a trusted brand. Uh, people want news and information every day on a global basis. Uh, if you look at why we bought the Huffington Post, we saw something that looked like it could be ignited by more resources, more video investment, more globalization. And for instance, when the new pope uh, was elected, it, we had Huffington Post Italy basically putting real-time content from Italy on Huffington Post uh, US, and I think we probably had some of the most unique coverage around uh, you know, the Pope being chosen, and there's a lot of other examples of that, but it, Huffington Post squarely fit into our, that kind of content strategy I described. Got it, got it. 
Okay, um, I think we're going to turn to the uh, audience now. Um, and there are, there are three uh, ground rules um, that I, I've been asked to uh, uh, assess for you. One is that all questioners must uh, identify themselves. Accurately. Yeah, <laughs> accurately. <laughs> Two is that uh, there's one brief question per person. Um, please, no speeches. And third uh, is questions end with a question mark, which seems self-evident to me, but <laughs> that's what it says. So uh, we have four mics, one, two, three, four. And I'll try to get to questioners on each mic uh, over the next 20, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes or so. Yeah, let's begin here. Hi, I'm Phil Hiltz, uh, formerly a New York Times reporter for about 13 years. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm struggling with this issue of how you find news and how it's going. One of the things that I worry most about is the content that the reporters are putting out there. The amount of time, the number of interviews each reporter is able to do to produce a story. And I'm worried that that is shrinking. Uh, is that inevitable, that we will go to shorter, punchier stories and not get the longer, not get quite as many interviews? Arthur, do you want to take um, I do not believe it is inevitable. Um, there's no question that on a breaking news story, speed now counts for, for everybody. Um, in the Boston bombing, uh, my colleagues at the, at the Globe uh, know this, um, and uh, you know, the um, traffic they got, the traffic we at the Times got, was stunning, the immediacy of it. Um, uh, during the presidential elections, we actually had better traffic covering the actual election than television network. So people are coming to news organizations now for video content, for the immediate delivery. All that said, are we still engaged in the uh, sort of the long form journalism? Absolutely, and I will use Snowfall as a great example of how you can create long form journalism where a journalist will spend a year working on a story and you can integrate video and, and graphic, and you can turn it into an experience unlike anything that we used to be able to do in our old days. Um, so I think it really does depend uh, on the story and, and the sense of immediacy, but this is why, quite frankly, you still need to invest in the journalism and in the journalists. And, um, and you're looking for a different set of experiences. Um, I was on a train coming up here from New York and uh, David Brooks was actually in, in the same car with me. He was going to Yale where he does some, some teaching. And he was talking about uh, the Washington Bureau he joined 11 years ago and the Washington Bureau he's part of now. Um, and quite frankly, it's younger, it's more vibrant. Uh, let's just say there's a lot more diversity. Um, because you have videographers, you have the technical team that's there to support, and it's just a, uh, but it's still a very, very powerful operation. Tim, I, uh, I'll get to you in a second, Carolyn, but I just want to ask you one question with respect to the Huffington Post and that fellow's question. How much of your stuff is now read on, you know, smartphones, mobile mm -hmm. devices, and how does that change the form factor? Uh, well, a lot. So basically, depending on which property or which section you're on, it could be 30, 40 percent of the traffic mm -hmm. now is uh, mobile. Uh, also, uh, to the, what we were talking about before with the mobile changes is, you know, people can actually consume more news with mobile. So if you take something like the New York Times and look at their usage, I'm, I'm guessing, Arthur, but just from mm -hmm. you look at somebody who reads the desktop or the newspaper, once you add mobile, they don't switch their consumption 100 percent to mobile. They actually add uh, consumption. So on average, exactly. if you look at the Pew research from last year, people typically add about 30% consumption uh, to that. And I think on the form factor side, you know, one thing I think that's, that's a little cloudy on the web right now is there's sort of the old Hearst model of audience development where people are writing fast stories with not tons mm -hmm. of facts to, to get uh, audience. And then there's journalism. And if you read the Hearst book, you know, he basically talks a lot about the fact he invested in something called the Sob Sisters which would write stories that were so horrific it would make people cry. And right next to it, he would have story, you know, the hard news. And that kind of... That, like that, a BuzzFeed that, model. Like a BuzzFeed model. That, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's, well, that's what's happening on the web today. Is yeah. You have companies competing. Here's the bad news. If you're one of those companies, you don't have Arthur's brand. So you need to do things to gain uh, traffic. So they will be, just like Hearst did, more aggressive about mixing low, low quality, high quality together. You know, Huffington Post did some of the same stuff 
does some of the same stuff. Carolyn, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, the, the only thing that I would say is I think there's been a huge shift in content. And apart from uh, smaller newsrooms, you know, 10 years ago, a metro paper would send 15 people to the Olympics, a bunch of them. I mean, <laughs> was that really necessary? So as you're seeing a lot more information about audiences, um, a number of newspapers are actually collapsing, for example, a, for breaking news only, a radio and a TV, a, a, a newspaper newsroom, but then really investing on the investigative side and being much more um, specific about the areas that they're going to invest in from an investigative side. So I think that that whole area is changing, and it's pretty interesting. OK, my apologies. Let's go to this mic. Uh, my name is Jason Gray. I'm a graduate student. Uh, first, just want to thank all three of you, uh, all four of you, for being here and doing this. What an incredible opportunity. I'm appreciative of it. Uh, I want to follow up on the conversation on local journalism. My question is around uh, what makes it work when it does and what makes it not work when it doesn't. Um, there was reference that in some cities or areas it's profitable, in other areas it isn't so much. Is it just the size of the city? What, what makes it work when it does and how, what should that mean for us in the future of local journalism? Caroline or Tim, do you do either? Um, I think a lot of it is trust and authenticity. Um, you know, I'll put my newspaper hat on. You still, you know, people still trust newspapers. It's, you know, you read something by somebody in the community who knows the community. That's a lot different than a feed um, of somebody who doesn't. So I think that's sort of the baseline for living and understanding a community. Okay, thank you. Um, up there. Um, hello, I'm Sam Feingold. I'm a junior at the college studying statistics, and I'm the campus editor for the Harvard Political Review. Um, so the, even the Harvard Political Review has changed from when Al Gore started it as a print publication to now having an online presence. It's, I mean, the culture has changed. We have a much larger publishing board. So I was wondering what it's been like culture-wise, and you know, what do you look for in journalists in terms of skills that are involved in the organization. You, New York Times puts up visualizations, video. There's so many new things that are on the site. What is it like now working at the New York Times as opposed to I love that question. 20 That's years ago? That's a great question. Um, yeah. You want to take it first, Arthur? Well, and then maybe I, I feel like I ought to have John Geddes answer that question. One of my uh, colleagues who just retired and was responsible for doing a lot of the hiring at the, uh, at the Times and uh, in the newsroom and, and the transition. Um, but let's, uh, let's agree that um, where, where did we, as, a, as a, uh, an industry, the fall short, the newspaper industry, engineers. That's what we didn't focus on fast enough. The need to have engineers building the systems that we are now using, building the tools that we're now using. And that's indeed where um, I will say the, the most challenging hiring still for, for us at the Times is getting those engineers in as we think about the new product development that we're creating. And we, are, you know, we didn't talk much about new product development, but we're in the, in the middle of, of working. You know, why, we, why should we be offering the New York Times? And that's it. So we, we're going to create new products. There's one in the works called Need to Know. That's its working title, aimed at a younger audience, to the point made earlier in the conversation giving a different experience. And yes, we have journalists involved in that. We have people from the ad, traditional ad sales, but highly engineered, because it's going to have to be a different experience. And it's going to have to be a different experience across devices. So that's where I think we probably missed the beat biggest. But um, uh, clearly, um, our journalists are, it's, it's, it's about training, training and hiring and training. But uh, you know, some of our more talented journalists on the web are the ones who are now able to ingrain, uh, to have video become part of that experience. And some have been doing it very well for a long time. Um, but we, want, we need more of that. We've doubled the video amount, the amount of video uh, in the last six months, I think, at the Times. Um, you're doing, we're all doing it. We're all experimenting. We realize that video, um, to your point earlier, is different on mobile than it's going to be on um, this, your, your large screen in your office. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot out there for us. 
Tim, do you want to take a whack? I mean, yeah. who were those interns that you were talking about? Uh, we, I mean, we have a big intern program, and uh, you know, the uh, people ask that advice, interns, and and uh, the journalism front, you know, basically just from learning it, and I have to do this myself. Is uh, I'd say there's two pieces of advice. I think one is you actually have to use the platforms uh, themselves, and I think that uh, you know, journalism is in a the, the new teeth growing stage, and you have to, you can't be a journalist if you don't understand the platforms and where things are going and to try them. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, actually, that I, I think is not a bad idea is instead of pulling up a chair next to another journalist every time you go to sit down, is pull up a chair next to an engineer. And, and one of the things that, you know, I saw at the Huffington <laughs> Post, which was really impressive, um, was the journalist and engineer sat together. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in many places around AOL, that was not the good. The engineer sat with the engineers, the journalist sat with the journalist, and really the you know, Huffington Post really helped the whole company rethink you know, that, that, uh, that process. And, and by the way, in, in a Silicon Valley, I spent 20 years going back and forth between Silicon Valley and New York. In Silicon Valley, that's what, there's a more collaborative type environment. So I, 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 would, I would ask you back, I don't know if you want to answer, but you know, what are the five fastest growing platforms, technology platforms for journalists to put content out faster and do you have an account on them? And that, that's essentially what you know, I ask internally and I expect you know, I, I need to know it, you need to know it, uh, it's really important. Good. Um, over here, then. Hi. My name is Ben Bolger, and I'm a Harvard alum. Uh, Netflix uh, commissioned a very high-profile series called House of Cards, and they did the bold uh, decision to just release all the episodes at one time. They're kind of playing with the idea of when, you, when to use time effectively. NBC and other affiliate you know, have, have begun to give limited interviews and then broadcast longer interviews in their morning shows, like the Today Show. So my question is, for the New York Times or AOL or other media providers, how are you experimenting with more investigative reporting and how to bundle or release the content either as one entire package or to kind of parcel it out and engage viewers more effectively? Well, I think we're all experimenting. Um, uh, I, I think I mentioned Snowfall earlier. Um, there was a huge section. And Snowfall was a, was a story about a, a terrible tragedy that took place uh, skiing um, a mountain in uh, Washington or Washington State, I think. Um, and it, when we printed it, it was a full section. Sports section was told. But the experience on the web was so immensely powerful because uh, of all of the, the, the video, the, the graphics, I mean, I, and unless you go and see this, I'm gonna do, I can't possibly do it justice. But when the woman is, is, you're reading about this woman who was skiing and all of a sudden she's caught up in the avalanche and the next thing you know she's under the snow and she's fighting for her life and oh by the way there's the video of her talking to you about it. Right there. I mean it brings it to life in a way that, but so, so a lot of it is experimenting and, and we put stories up on the web obviously before they are in the paper. Uh, we put magazine pieces up starting Wednesdays now for the Sunday Magazine. Um, but you mentioned earlier about um, devices changing the way people come to it. Uh, and you're absolutely right. We see that the, on the tablets, people come to stories at 9 o'clock at night, 8 to 10. Unbelievable tablet use because people want to see what's in tomorrow's paper. And so we just have to and I'm one of them, um, but it's a, it, that's part of the power of it, so I'm, that's part of the answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually the, um, you know, in a very astute way, I think Netflix took what normally distribution windows were set up to, for those economics of how things had been historically set up and said, you know what, human beings actually would probably behave different if you uh, gave them uh, the content all at once. So, you know, in a, in a testing way, but in a thoughtful way, we actually look at disruptive, when, how do you actually disrupt the behavior? And I, one, one saying I have inside, in, internally, we don't do a lot in sports, but I tell, tell people internally, I worked at ESPN for a while, you can't beat ESPN Sports Center by being 5% better. You have to be 75% better, 100% better, and the only way to do that is be really disruptive. So I think when we look at doing disruptive things around journalism, it's 
the, the release windows of what you do is actually a disruption point as much as the content is itself. Uh, that's one. And then the second one is distribution partnerships. Uh, and I think one thing we probably all are working on also mm -hmm. is you just named off the distribution of Googles, the Facebooks, you know, those people. Another way to be disruptive about when you release content and how is actually using those partners to do it as well. So I, I think we're all, you know, testing multi-tiered strategies. But I would point out Netflix from a brilliant standpoint recognize the difference between human behavior and how distributions were systems were set up and they went for human behavior and they want, they've done an amazing job. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go full circle now to this mic. Hi. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. oh, oh did we miss this one? I, I apologize. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go, go. Um, hi, my name's Selena. I'm a junior at the college interested in broadcast journalism. And my question was that given the fact that there's so many orga organizations now that offer news videos online, um, where do you see the future of TV news? I, I have a specific viewpoint on this. Uh, okay. But uh, Basically, if you look at the uh, consumption patterns of how people use phones and tablets uh, and those things, uh, the fact of the matter is when you look, the average TV show is basically, if you took a half hour, 22 minutes of content and eight minutes of uh, commercials. When you watch how people basically use the web-enabled platforms in general, I think in a disruptive way, there's a uh, faster way than 22 minutes to give people tons of uh, information. So I think you'll see the advent and scale of faster, higher quality uh, content overall. And I think from a curation standpoint that people still want trusted brands and trusted people as much as the world you know, seems like it's UGC, user generated based content. When you ask those interns what they're following, they're not randomly going out to just poke around to find information. They want someone to tell them uh, I, I just met with somebody who's really well known in the uh, in a offline content vertical on Friday, and uh, she said to me, "I said, why do you think you're successful, and why have you been successful going to the web?" She said, "Because I tell people what they want, and what they need." She goes, "I don't make things a jump ball; I tell them." So I think the future of television and web video together is going to be a very highly curated, very disruptively time-based thing, almost like the Netflix question about how much content you get in, in what uh, time period. And I, I think it's very exciting. I think there's a, a potential for disruption. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Lisker. I'm a sophomore at the college, as well as a photographer and uh, staff writer for the Harvard Political Review. Um, I, was, uh, I uh, was interested in your anecdote that you mentioned about the Chinese woman who read the New York Times every day. Um, how have your publications changed to uh, be able to convince uh, more of the worldwide uh, readers to read your respective publication? And similarly, how have you managed to retain the national readers? For example, why should I read the NSA news from the New York Times or the Huffington Post as opposed to going to the Guardian or Der Spiegel or some other publication? Well, it's a very, it's a very good question and there's, there's no s simple answer to it. Um, the, so as, we, as I mentioned, we're going to be rebranding the, the, the International Herald Tribune and part of that is to further tighten the journalistic ties. So we'll have a newsroom in, in Paris and London. We'll have a newsroom in Hong Kong. We'll have the, obviously a newsroom in New York. And really what we're looking at is a 24 hour news cycle. And when people are asleep in New York and waking up in uh, China we, uh, and in Asia, you know, we want the, the, the um, the ability for them to come to the site and see it may be more tailored to the Asian point of view. That doesn't mean the stories will be different, or that we're not going to change, but we'll put different stories in different places, give people an experience, and of course, all of this is being driven by the fact that more and more people can create the content experience they value. If they care about sports, they can put that higher, and if they care about politics, they can put that higher. So it's about, about that kind of human adaptation as, as well. So, um, but it's going to be um, an ongoing issue as we learn more and more how, how to do this. No question. I just, you know, our strategy has been to partner with local news providers in, in uh, 
in country. So most of our international editions actually have the local large media partner, right. El Pais in, in, uh, in, in uh, France, uh, as an example. So we believe that we're getting kind of the best of the Huffington Post plus uh, the best of uh, what's actually local in France together. The example I use with the Pope. Uh, but I, I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's really uh, it's competitive, and uh, we plan on competing on a local also, basis. Is it also political, and is there a point of view issue? I mean, is, is part of what you're getting at that there's a political side to this as well as a journalistic side? I, I don't know. I'm just asking. That, yeah. There's yeah. no I mean, question that that, that, that well, that, that's a, that's an important point. I mean, one of the challenges is how do we give and you know the same to you? How do we make sure the experience isn't just oh we're getting the New York point of view yes. uh, in Spain, um, and we have to make sure that we are giving people a, a broader breadth than that. Caroline, did you have? But a I, I mean, I I think that's one of the beautiful things about the internet is yeah. you can go to the Guardian and you can go to El País and you can go to the New York Times and you can go, and you know you can get a lot of the New York Times may cover a story differently than the Guardian may cover a story. So that's you know an advantage that we all have. Thank you. Um, up here. Hi, I'm Amna Hashmi, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee. So with regards to social media, how have you as journalistic companies viewed it? Because many complex ideas can't be condensed to 140 characters. So is that a hindrance to thoughtful reporting and considered responses? Or has the impetus to clicks and that sharing capacity overruled any sort of negative effects of social media? Do you, Thank you. Do you want all three to answer, or you, um, do you have a specific? Whoever has any thoughts. <laughs> Thank uh, you. It's a general question, guys. Who, does anyone have a thought about social or Twitter? I, I mean, I, I think Twitter is almost like a caption to a photograph. And if it's engaging, you're going to go find more about what that person has to say about something. Sometimes people use Twitter as a, I'm going to say whatever I think and get in trouble later. So it sort of depends on who's tweeting. But I, I view Twitter as sort of a caption. But isn't Twitter just a giant distribution system yeah. for yeah. journalism? That's I mean, right. That's yeah, so it just draws you in. It's a tool. It's a powerful tool. And it's a tool for getting information in as well as getting information out. Yeah. And the challenge for journalists is to be able to sift through the information you're getting to make the a story, generally a complex story, um, understandable. Also, I would say the next iteration of the web, you know, people debate this right now, but uh, Twitter's launching cards and other things. So mm -hmm. what started as a just feeder for information quickly, now they're building in more infrastructure inside of Twitter. So, you know, one of the things that some of our brands are doing are starting to build more inclusive pieces of content that actually fit inside of Twitter. So you not only get the link, but then you can have a longer, you know, experience. And I think a lot of the newspapers are doing it, New York Times, everybody. So I, that where Twitter is today and where Twitter or Facebook are going to be in the future, my guess is they're going to try to build out their distribution cap capabilities uh, overall. I think it's best known for the short, but I think you're going to see other things get longer on those platforms. Mm, interesting. And a lot of journalists use Twitter as for source material. You know, did anyone see such and such and such happen? And let's not pretend this is new. This is something that newspapers, journalists have had to deal with for decades. We, we don't remember what it was like when all of a sudden you could pick up a telephone and you weren't dealing with your source one-on-one. -on -one. But it had a big impact. And people said, oh, you can't trust what people are going to say over a, a wire. <laughs> um, and go back even further, the telegraph. Um, because in, in, the 18, in the late 1850s, a New York publisher wrote in his own newspaper, and it was not the New York Times, that he had just witnessed the death of newspapers. Literature, he said, must, will survive, but newspapers must fade away. He had just met the telegraph. And what they didn't understand is, no, this is going to feed information in. It's not, so it's, it's a tool that we are all getting better and better at using. And social media is an extension that's gone on for a while now. Thank you. Up here. Um, hi, my name's Skylar Burland. Um, I will be presenting the official Twitter question uh, for tonight's forum. <laughs> so the question um, primarily addresses, um, actually it 
kind of also goes off of what someone asked a few questions ago. Um, you guys were discussing how you can now choose kind of your political angle um, based on the website you'd like online. This question more addresses because of the combination of Huffington Post and AOL, you now have the opportunity to expose to millions of people who might not even be using the internet to obtain news. Um, you're now able to feed them political information. So how do you go about um, not necessarily choosing, because you discuss kind of the formula for choosing what you feed um, the people who go on AOL and then are exposed to the Huffington Post, but how do you basically choose the political angle in which you show this information? Sure, so uh, AOL and Huffington Post basically um, there's a lot of stories from Huffington Post on AOL and will continue to be. There's also a news chooser uh, that you can choose to customize the news that you want uh, overall. And the other thing I'd just say is I think the Huffington Post started probably with more of a political uh, angle overall. And I think one thing that's happened a lot actually, if you look through the Huffington Post, is you know over time there's been a lot of uh, forums set up for people with different political views to share on the Huffington Post. So. Uh, the Huffington Post, you know, if you go to either Huffington Post Live or Huffington Post almost on a daily basis, there's a pretty wide uh, range of views. And um, one of the things we thought was important from a brand standpoint is you have different brands with different types of users on them. And uh, by using the Huffington Post, we feel like it's one of the best news sources in the world for us to offer the AOL users, but we also offer the AOL users a lot of different choices as well. And, and uh, you know, I think actually from a standpoint of opportunity, uh, this is different than where a lot of our competitive set are going. Our competitive set is going to feed-based, everything's a feed, uh, and there's no voice at all. And one of the things that we've done is actually said, we're gonna have uh, a voice, we're gonna have some opinions about things, and those things, and we wanna curate, save people time by doing that uh, overall. So we try to give people multiple views and multiple voices. Uh, but we, we really like the Huffington Post and the users like the Huffington Post. So we've, and if you just look at Facebook stats or Twitter stats, you know, a lot of people in the world love the Huffington Post. So we offer that to AOL users. But we, we do give people a choice of what news source you want. Thank you. Yo. Hi, my name. Yeah, you're good. Hi, my name is Jenny Choi. I'm a sophomore living in Winthrop House, and I work with Sam and Paul on the publishing board of the Harvard Political Review. Um, so in the recent years, we've seen an amazing increase in the, in the number of ways you can depict news. You can do it in interactives, you can do it, do it through videos, photos, and diagrams. And even with the Boston Marathon, the most shared thing on my Facebook news feed was an interactive of how it happened rather than an article describing how it happened. So my question would be, what do you see as the place of the written news article in the future of journalism? That's a great question. Who wants to take that? I'll just preface Arthur's comments with, um, I think the written word provides a lot of context that something immediate like an image or a video can provide. If you read, as I was reading today, um, the report uh, having to do with this conference, um, there's a lot of context there that n nothing other than the written word could really convey. So um, I think it's context more than anything else. So um, if you think about the technology changes of the last 100 years, the internet is the first one to bring us back to the written word. Radio took us away from the written word. Television took us further away from the written word, and the internet the web gave us the ability to integrate the written word back in. So I'm actually a huge fan for a number of reasons, because the technology does give you the ability to engage in all different methods. And what we're learning over and over is using any single method is failure. It's the multiplicity of methods integrated with each other that is breeding real success. Great. Um, I think we're full circle again, back here. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Shah Rukh Khan, and I'm a freshman at the college. And uh, Mr. Armstrong, I believe earlier, if I uh, did interpret it correctly, you said not just anyone can be a journalist. Um, I, I'm not sure if I did interpret it, but uh, what about bloggers, and how have they disrupted like professional media? and um, uh, 
like really how are journalists working to go around these people who might just sit at home and steal news from different websites or something like that? Uh, so I would, one thing is, I think anyone can be a journalist if they want to be a journalist. I think at the end of the day, uh, when you think about what, you know, consumers are smart. Uh, and I think over a period of time, they actually uh, know who's feeding kind of consistent real information to them and those who aren't. I mean, I, I would say, I, I'm guessing I didn't even make it public, but you guys have hundreds of thousands of digital subscribers yes. to the Times, correct? Yes, we do. Uh, my guess is if you guys started doing content that was things people didn't want to pay for or see as real, you wouldn't have that uh, ability. And I think that from a disruptive standpoint, though, let me, let me take one step back. What you see happening in the blogging community uh, overall and you see across the internet is people, almost like the Netflix example of taking advantage of situations to be disruptive to gain audience. And I would not undercut the ability of bloggers and people building blogs and specific topics to basically disrupt the information flow of what's happening at larger publications. And look, we've, I've been a huge investor in that with TechCrunch and Huffington Post uh, and those things. But the reality is, and this is why I go back to history, if there's a book, I think it's called Park Row, there's a book about newspapers in, in uh, New York City and, uh, and if you look, read the Hearst book, uh, you'll, you see something inside of those books, which is the same thing that's happening on the web right now, which is people are using different forms of content, uh, bloggers, uh, Twitter feeds, those things to disrupt people's flow to gain audience. And there's a difference between audience development and journalism. A lot of the tactics on the web about people trying to go blogs are about audience development. And then what happens is they turn it into journalism. You know, there's very well-known properties that started off as disruptive, 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 and as soon as they got enough audience and they said, oh, we can make this into a business, they said, let's move more towards uh, journalism. And there's 15 great examples of those uh, on the web. So I, I think bloggers can be very powerful, and I think also, you know, if you look at YouTube, for instance, I mean, if you look at the number of people on YouTube that have views that are in categories that are disruptive, uh, you find more people who resemble bloggers uh, overall. So I. I I think there's a very big opportunity for people to do disruptive things around blogging and, and other things. And for journalists to become very successful bloggers yes, yes. and expand their footprint, yep. not only for the institution they may represent, but individually. And the journalist as brand is a subject that all of us have to be spending more and more time dealing with. Yep. Yeah. My apologies, but we, we have only time for one more question, and in deference to my mistake before, I'll, I'll turn to this, this mic and use. Uh, uh. Hi, I'm Jenny Shaw. I'm a freshman in Harvard College. Um, and there, there's sort of a lot of talk of a bunch of new people coming online, and um, Eric Schmidt, Jared Cohn, for example, put it at 5 billion people um, in the coming decades, some of them from conflict zones and sort of other. Um, places and I was wondering sort of how that might change the target audience um, for online journalism. That's a great question. It's a great question. Um, <coughs> well, any one of you can take it. I, I, oh, I, I, Arthur, didn't, I didn't quite hear the okay, first the, part the of question it. Is, uh, right now we, 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 we have, you know, a, roughly a little over a billion people online, mm -hmm. um, mostly from the developed countries, although, mm -hmm. you know, what, what she's saying is that Eric, I think it was Eric and Jerry. Uh, yeah, Cohen Eric and in, Eric the, in their book uh, talked about uh, you know five five billion people oh, ultimately okay. being gotcha. online. Right. Um, how does that change all of your approaches to content journalism? Well, content it's 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 the, it's the great question and the great opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, way to end. Uh, a year and a half ago, what was the what was the largest uh, country outside the United States, the five largest outside the U.S. for people coming to the New York Times? Anybody want to take a guess? Iran? <laughs> no. Coming to the NY Times on uh, digitally, obviously, after the U.S. was Canada. UK was next. Australia was number three. And nope. But you get the thought, English language, right? That's on the desktop. On mobile, outside the US, China was number one. And this was before we did the Chinese language website. This was in English. 
So that, I think, speaks very much to your, your thought. I mean, the, the possibilities of our growth, the possibilities of the value of the quality information that maybe they can't, people can't get in other certain places, is, is really speaks to the, to the opportunity, I think. Yeah. It's also going to grow much faster than people think. As we look at the world today of the internet, there's a lot of people working on very uh, low-flying satellites, things that will actually increase the uh, broadband capabilities and smartphone capabilities. So while they're going to come online, they're probably going to come online at a higher bandwidth and better devices than we think also. So the opportunity is going to mm -hmm. be. And it, it just accelerates the, the um, integration that Arthur talked about for storytelling purposes. All right, wonderful. Yeah. I wish we had time to take all of the questions, but we don't. And so now I want to introduce the, the third member of Riptide, Paul Sagan, to wrap it all up. Martin, thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's great for the three of us to be back here. We felt the warm embrace of Harvard from when we came, especially Alex and the team at, at Shorenstein and the Kennedy School and Anne Marie and Josh at, at Neiman. And this project wouldn't have happened uh, one of my roles tonight in the anchor position is to give you the shameless plug. So if we've intrigued you, go to digitalriptide.org. Or if you can't remember that short URL, just go to uh, the Shorenstein site or, or Neiman Labs and find the link. And uh, I don't think John probably scared you too much with the word count. But if he did, you don't have to read it all. You can search all of it and read any part, or you can watch some of the videos. And I promise you, if you let these people speak for themselves, you will be engaged and you'll learn, you'll laugh. And the truth is, in the 60-some interviews, if you're having insomnia trouble, there are a couple that will put you to sleep. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you which ones those are. You'll have to go hunt for them yourself. Needless to say, the three here are not, not in that included, category. <laughs> or Martin's either. Those four are exempted. So I think tonight's discussion was serious and sober, and, and Riptide is meant to be that. But it was not a pessimistic discussion, and it's not a pessimistic conclusion, and we're not pessimistic about the future of news. So we certainly, as we looked back and talked to people, we found that the truism that was most true, of course, was what's reasonably clear is what's already happened in the past. And we and the people we interviewed pretty much agreed on what was clear. One of the things was don't be nostalgic. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be nostalgic about what we've, we've lost. I don't think you heard nostalgia here for what was, because the truth is, and it's certainly been written in at least some of those 70,000 other articles that John talked about, is that journalism wasn't always great. There were golden ages with many, many flaws, many, many incorrect stories, many communities that just weren't covered at all before, many voices that won't, weren't heard from, not enough diversity. It's one of the things that we encountered even as we went to interview people and didn't find the kind of diversity we'd like in every aspect of our lives. It wasn't in journalism before, and digital disruption has exacerbated it in some ways and improved it in others. And so we weren't nostalgic about the past, and there are great examples today. Snowfall is one of them. And across the board, a great journalism that's even more illuminating online and will get more voices there. There were a couple of things about the past that weren't touched on tonight that are important threads. One was this idea of original sin. It was this idea that mostly had Martin and Arthur not given away the news for free, <laughs> all of this just would have worked out OK over the long term. Well, that wasn't, wasn't the case. If everybody who had news had not given it away for free online, the digital disruptors, people with different models, gave it away for free. I saw one of them, David Graves, is in the back if you need to string someone up. He was at Reuters and Yahoo, he gave it away for free with a different business model, and that's where the genie got out of the bottle and people had to react. The other thing that was so important, and there was some really interesting vocabulary I want to highlight tonight because you would not have heard it in a panel like this years ago, and that was about the importance of engineers. So you heard tonight about journalists and engineers sitting together, and Arthur said a highly engineered product when referring to need to know. One of the things that news organizations didn't do, and they seem to be learning now and must learn, is you have to embrace engineers, and then you have to figure out how to hire them and collaborate with them, because the disruptors and the people who have built the biggest platforms online today are engineering-driven companies. And most of them not only have engineers, the engineers are in charge. And most of the traditional media companies, they didn't have them, they couldn't hire them, and they certainly didn't put them in charge. And that has to be a theme for the future of successful news online. 
So what's a lot less clear even to the three of us after all of this? Well, what's going to happen next and how is serious journalism going to get paid for since the subsidy of advertising has been ripped away and we've gone at best from analog dollars to that expression of digital dimes. There are lots of predictions about the future of news um, that people agree with, most they don't, and we didn't have a full consensus either among the three of us, which is really why we built Riptide as a web-based platform. We hope that others here at Harvard pick up on it, that more voices, more interviews, and more stories get shared so we can keep documenting what's coming and has happened. Even since we finished our draft of the essay and went into post-production this summer, look at what's happened. So Arthur sold the Boston Globe to John Henry. The Post was sold by the Grams and company to Jeff Bezos. And more of this change is coming. We are sure of that. There's an aspect to Riptide that is a Rashomon tale, which is no two people really agree on exactly what happened. But we had a belief when we started, and, and it was confirmed as we went, that if you got enough of the right people who were involved in an event talking about it, you could get close enough to understand, we think, what happened and to learn about what might happen next. And we tried to do that in the project. And we think it's important because understanding how journalism is going to continue and thrive, we think, is really important. It's part of the ideal that's embodied here in the Kennedy Forum at the Kennedy School and the Shorenstein Center, the importance of a vibrant press. Because the question that does hang out there and wasn't answered tonight and still isn't answered, I think, is are we going to find ways to cover the obscure school board hearing mm -hmm. and the, Dam the Damascus Bureau alike as effectively as the digital world has already figured out how to cover celebrity gossip, the daily political rants in Washington, and even the weather? So behalf, on behalf of Martin and John and myself, we absolutely agree that the story ahead is going to be far more interesting even than the story that we've told. So we hope that you will stay tuned to what we've done and more importantly to this evolving thread. And we have a warning. Watch out for the riptide. Don't get washed out to sea the next time it rolls in because it always does. Thank you very much and have a great evening. <laughs>